It's, uh, it's on, yeah. Hi guys, um, I'm just hearing a little background, so maybe what we can do is uh, we can probably just mute some of the initial participants. But if you do want to communicate and, and participate as well, you can certainly raise your hand and we will open up your audio and video as well to, to contact us. Yeah, that's right. This is John. So if you guys heard Dr. Badezi, if you uh, can click the little microphone icon to mute yourself. Uh, if you don't do it, I'll do it for you. Um, and use the chat on the hand icon if you want to come onto the microphone. So I'll give you about five more seconds and I'll, and I'll mute uh, the, the class. And then we'll, we'll begin. Right. Sounds, good. Sounds good. Okay, guys, everyone's muted. Good. All right, thank you very much, John, and welcome. Welcome to another installment of our course, One World, One Health, One Medicine. In fact, as part of the month of November, we are in the 11th of our 12th series, and which, is, which is sort of leading to the end of the course. So we're excited, but also sad at the same time. And as part of this month of November, I think it is very interesting for us to take a different perspective on the topic of One World, One Health, One Medicine. We are going to engage a conversation on zoonoses as a blind spot for One Health. And for those of you who know me by now in particular, you can recognize that I have my own biases towards zoonoses. But joining us today, to engage in that conversation is Professor Antonio McDonnell, who we're very happy to, to have as part of our year-long seminar series. And we are very much confident that you will bring your own, a different perspective into the conversation, which is needed. Because if we are in fact speaking about one world, one health, one medicine, it means that no one should be left behind. Everyone has a part to play in, in understanding as well as intervening in health as well, individually as well as for a population. So, Professor McDonald, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Medesi, for inviting me. I am looking forward to this because it's not a conversation that we normally have. We always feel I am from the School of Arts and Sciences um, in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. So my PhD is in literature. I would think that most people would think, now what does a literature professor have to say about One Health? My area of interest is really, I'm a Caribbeanist. I do a lot of Caribbean studies. I teach Caribbean studies here. So I'm hoping that that is the take. I'm going to bring to it a Caribbean perspective on culture, on education, and just on general practices, ways of being. Good, and that's, that's, that's quite interesting as well. Um, when, when we think about the whole aspect of human animals and the environment interacting, I am sure you can immediately highlight some seminal work and pieces out there in terms of how authors over the ages would have served to depict this whole aspect of humans, animals, and environment interacting with one another as well. Well, I would want to use a very wonderful example. I don't know how many of you are aware of the, now he's recently deceased, um, Nobel laureate, mm -hmm. um, and knighted by St. Lucia government, Sir Derek, Derek Walker. Walker. Yeah. And one of his earliest works was a play called Tijan, and his brothers. And it is really a folk story about three, usually the story begins, there was a man who had three sons. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, it would be there was a woman who had three sons. But what is interesting about that story is that Tisha is going to be having an encounter with the devil. And the devil has this opposition. But in to help Tisha to defeat the devil, it is the animals in the forest that point him to potential pitfalls that he must avoid. His, three, his other two brothers also have that encounter with the devil and they lose because they do not give any credence to the wisdom of these animals that they meet. So for a long time we have been, we have grown up with those stories understanding that the environment is made of, that nature is a force to be dealt with, to be respected, to be understood, and that all of us constitute nature, humans as well as animals, and the fauna also. So it's not just flora, I mean, it's not just fauna, it's also flora, the trees, all these things are important. So that is part of what we, this is the direction that we take it from, 
that these things interface and have meaning. I know it's a very different take from yours, but at least, you know, it's something that we need to give value to. And I feel that in the educating of our people, in educating them into about wellness, we need to be cognizant of those things. So because it is under, in understanding those things that we are going to tailor our means of educating them because we will understand the cultural biases that they come with. Yeah. Um, hopefully we get a context as to where Professor McDonald's is coming from also because that hopefully will, will provide some impetus into how we're going to treat today's topic on One Health. Now I would like to sort of preface our conversation by this going through a, a bit of a chronology of events over the past let's say, three to four decades, especially at the point in 1960s, 70s, where there was an expansion in the human population, exponential increase in the human population. Consistent with that increase was uh, increased demand for food. And to match that demand was an increased supply. One of the strategies that society, that, 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 that the, the globe, took was to select some species of animals, which was poultry, swine, cattle, for example. And at the same time, the human population exploded. At the same time, these animal species also increased in numbers, especially via production. Now, from the context of diseases that are shared between humans and animals, the strategy towards increasing animal production would have contributed to mechanisms which supported the crossover of diseases among species. Examples will be avian influenza, bird flu, from the concentration of large numbers of birds, and the virus having the opportunity to undergo genetic drifting and shifting across these poultry populations. We have had influenza type A H1N1, swine flu, mm -hmm. from swine population. So here we have examples where our decisions and our practices have selected for challenges, disease burdens, mm -hmm. which sort of exemplify the, the whole concept of One Health. I would like for us to recognize that there is more to this conversation than the diseases themselves. And I must admit that's my bias. And this is why we're discussing zoonoses as a blind spot of One Health. Because if you focus on, let's say, the diseases, on the pathogens, how do we prevent, how do we control them? What else are we missing? Okay. And now, I just thought it was really interesting that you mentioned swine, beef, pork, and chicken as your food choices. Mm -hmm. And yes, we agree that they are readily available, but in this local landscape, in Grenada, there's something that we have forgotten. Fish. fish. Mm -hmm. And fish is an integral part of the diet. So how that is already, well, I wouldn't want to call it a blind spot. I would mm -hmm. want to say it's a, an, a neglected area mm -hmm. that we have to look at fish diets and ocean health and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is a potential area that we need to educate people. We need to shift slightly these dietary choices so that we can use what we have. And then that brings us to what is happening in the ocean in terms of the destruction of the coral because that, and the destruction of mangroves because that means that our fish population is being imperiled in terms of sustainability. The lionfish in the Caribbean, for yeah. example, for those of you who do not know, the lionfish is not native to this area and it has eaten most of the herbivorous fish. And because these fish are being consumed, that means that these fish are not helping to keep the coral clean because they were consuming the algae. They're not doing that now, and so therefore the coral is now impacted. So you see, it causes a chain reaction. But if we eat the lionfish, and I mean, if we educate people into making it a part of our diet, because right now it isn't. We mm -hmm. say it's safe to eat, mm -hmm. but what educational means are we going to do use to make people understand that we can incorporate this so that we can decimate the sand fish population. So I'm always concerned with, okay, so you have these crossover of diseases, but what it is that we have here that can mitigate against it? What, 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 how can we use our strengths and how can we educate our people into using these strengths? So I guess looking at like, like social cultural practices then. That's really yeah. very important yeah. to me. And when we talk about social cultural practices, 
in the Caribbean, for example, we have to understand that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. Because in the Caribbean, you have language. The language is different. You have Creole languages. Mm -hmm. You have people who are largely oral rather than scribal. So therefore, the programs that you're creating have to meet them where they are to take them where, they want, where you want them to go. So it may not be that you're going to have public service announcements on the television, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to do rigorous community engagement mm -hmm. so that you can get people involved at that level and you can spread the message using a host of different modalities. So, so for me, then how can we, as educators, help you to do your work? So it's about yeah. partnerships. Yeah. Uh, and that, that sort of brings my mind the the management of the West Africa Ebola experience, mm -hmm. where one of the contributing determinants was, was, was behavior, mm -hmm. in that the, the, the cultural practices is washing of the dead bodies and, and, and touching dead bodies as well, but this behavior sort of increases your exposure likelihood to the virus. So from a behavioral perspective, the control of that disease required some type of paradigm shift yes. in, in a society, in a culture. So, so how do we allow for that a balance exactly and still respect the cultural yes. traditions don't change it necessarily because yeah, health is physical health, mental and social exactly and so when it's like you always have to it's always a balancing act because yes for the time being we may have to adjust those practices but we sometimes we we, we tend to say you must not do this but we do not offer a, a viable alternative okay. that is still respectful of the cultural practices. Mm -hmm. So there must be, I'm not saying there will always be a middle ground, but there must always be an attempt, mm -hmm. a negotiation, to find a situation that is going to benefit both people. Because if you don't have compliance, all is lost. And how do you therefore engender compliance? How do you engage people so that there can be compliance? Mm -hmm. Well, I think invite anyone who's out there to certainly chime in with your questions, with your comments, etc. You can feel free to open up your audio, raise your hand, or you can type in your questions, comments on the text box as well, because we want to ensure this is, a, is an interactive type of conversation that we're having. Maybe there are issues and topics you would like us to focus on at the same time. So please feel free to let us know. My 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 thinking now is we are focusing on on, on social and cultural types of identity. Mm -hmm. which is important, and that is part of the, the value association mm -hmm. for, for population groups. And it's also, we have experiences to serve us as a risk factor sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in the world in which we live in today now, what we're finding, at least in, in some parts of the world, is that the, the culture is becoming more homogenous. And that whole universality and consistency of practice, of experiences, mm -hmm. and we're finding in the Caribbean, in the Western world, mm -hmm. and more and more in other parts of the world, how will that impact this whole issue of One Health? If we're having idiosyncratic cultural identities being a, a point of reference, but that in itself is being diluted out. You see, and that's the thing, because you keep saying it's being homogenized. But what is the default to which it's being homogenized? It's being homogenized to a Western practice. Mm -hmm. But already, because the world is not only Western. So if you're going to move people to that way of thinking, I'm thinking that there are different layers at which they are moving, you know, because on the surface, it seems to be homogenous. But below it, you have these cultural practices that you are calling idiosyncratic that still remain and still govern what they're doing. So yes, on one level you have mm -hmm. that leveling out, on another level you have people returning. And I want to use a very simple example. Somebody gets sick, somebody discovers that they have cancer. Now there are certain ways of return, you're going to go to the doctor, the doctor is going to do certain things. But even while you're going to the Western doctor, you have already gone to the bush lady. <laughs> and in fact, people are saying, this bush solution, I know this works better than what the doctors are saying. Let's not do chemo. Let's put you on a course of bush medicine. But what has happened is that people are doing both. They were thinking, yeah. let me hedge my bets. Yeah. Let me go with what the doctor is saying. And let me go with what both. the lady in the village is saying. But these two things sometimes 
cannot work together. In fact, it can work against each other in a very dangerous way. So how do you now change this? So you need to first recognize that there might be an alternative, that alternative health, belief, health system belief there operating. And you need to caution them and say, hey, if you're going to go with this, you cannot also go with that. Yeah, but you have to understand that these two things are going to operate. In the Caribbean faith, mm -hmm. people will say, I used to have cancer and I don't have cancer anymore because I prayed about it. And I know a lot of doctors dismiss that. How could you shake someone if they believe that? So you have to have, I think that doctors have to become increasingly aware of those different cultural values operating. And so that kind of sensitivity will govern how they treat the patient. So that's part of what I'm looking at. So even if it looks the same, I'm saying if you look deeply at it, you will realize it's not quite the same. So that's it. That, 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 that's, that's, that's quite deep. Huh? <laughs> it is, it is. But, but what that requires, though, is, is a level of cultural competence mm -hmm. to, to, to match the, 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 the cultural identity of respective individuals as well. Yes. And that's, that's a challenge. Yes, because you see, we use that word very often, cultural competence. But you have to first have cultural willingness, you know, you have to have a lack of bias. You have to be open to it. Mm -hmm. Because very often you just think, why this sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> this sounds really, you know, and they, we're going to use the word voodoo very loosely and say this sounds like a voodoo business. No. You, cause you, so you have to respect it. And the cultural competence comes first with respecting the culture that you're dealing with. And to respect it, you leave yourself open to understanding it, even if you do not have to necessarily agree with it. But you have to try to understand it. How people bury their dead was a very good example. Mm -hmm. Because for some people, the ancestors will not rest if you have not given them a proper burial. And no matter what you say, you will not be able to shake that belief in them. Mm -hmm. So you will have to say, OK, for the time being, this is what we're going to have to do. And you're going to have to ask your ancestors for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to engage in all kinds of expiation rights for the time being. When things are normal again, you can return to your other practices. Or you might have to modify it because these practices are putting you at a health risk. But, but this, is, this, is this interesting though? Because sometimes when you look at different parts of the world, mm -hmm. you look at the different population groups, different geographical locations, mm -hmm. and different cultural practices. And invariably, sometimes some population groups, some cultural practices seems to be at more risk mm -hmm. to, let's say, adverse life events or adverse disease burdens. So somehow, this whole aspect of culture can be positive and negative. It can yeah. be protective or it can be, or it can be selective mm -hmm. for, 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 for burdens. Yes, because it's going to put you at rest. Yeah, so, so how can we collectively identify what cultural practices that you want to promote, and what cultural practices you want to provide alternatives yes. to, towards, towards, towards healthier outcomes. Yes. That's it. And that's where the research comes in. Because having done the research, once you have, you're going to make your findings available to the people, not from a, the great intuit speaks, this is what I'm going to pontificate, but you're going to say, this is what the research is suggesting. And for your education programs, it has to be a collaborative effect. It has to be you involve NGOs and the government and everybody. And you will gradually, using your young people, shift them away from certain practices that are injurious to their health. Okay, so for example, look at our fondness for turtle meat in the mm -hmm. region. The, the way, or, or to eat the iguana, and the, some of these things. So how do you change the mindset that is going to allow for people not to include those in their diets. It has to start with the young people because the old people will say, but we've always done this. Mm -hmm. But if you can educate the young people out of that sensibility, then you stand a better chance. But you have to educate them using a language that they can understand and that makes sense to them or else they're the older people will come in and say, this is nonsense, this doesn't work. And they'll not be able to defend why they believe that. The young people must understand why they're doing it. And that's why I think it's very, very important that all of these programs start with the young children. I, I, I recognize and, and appreciate your, your thematic focus on education mm -hmm. and, and using that as the medium towards informing effective cultural practices. Mm -hmm. 
But from a public health perspective, I also recognize that education is intended to, to inform attitudes and perceptions. And if you inform attitudes and perceptions, that should translate into behavior. But that's not necessarily the case. And, and the reason why I'm saying it is because maybe let's say your diet. Your diet, let's say, comes from your cultural practices, mm -hmm. your traditions. Some diets are more predisposing to diabetes. Exactly. Obesity. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone has that knowledge and everyone receives education to that effect. But but at the end point, though, we're not able to effectively utilize the educational modality to effect social cultural change. Furthermore, before you come in, the economic system also doesn't necessarily allow because the healthier options are more expensive. Yeah. So, so here we have forces that are fighting against knowledge and awareness and education. Exactly. How, 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 do, we, how do we try to, to, to sort of match these limitations? Because I think that part of the research has to be more culturally specific. So let's go back to diet and diabetes. Mm -hmm. We can say what you cannot eat. You know, you're going to say that you cannot have foods that are high in you know, all the you know, a high carbohydrate diet mm -hmm. is not going to be good for you. Now, a high carbohydrate diet before, when you were walking up so many hills, yeah. was fine because you were going to burn it out. But now, no. But what I'm saying is that there are certain things in the diet that is available to them that they can eat more of. And so you can say, instead of eating so much of this, why don't you eat so much of that, which is not outside of their, their gardens, mm -hmm. which is right there, but the research has to show them what is available locally on the ground. And I, I don't think that we've done enough of that research. And I'm saying, making that point, not only for the Caribbean, but I think in a lot of places, the research has to be targeted at looking at what is on, what is part of their reality and how you can readjust those things to cater for it. So, for example, do we in the Caribbean say, if you're not going to eat all of this, what else can you eat that's not foreign, that's not imported? Have we done that research? I think the University of the West Indies may have done some of it. I'm sure that they would have. But is that widely disseminated? If you go on the internet and you say, what is going to be my alternative? Using Caribbean food, what comes up? Or if an African person in West Africa, what would be my alternative? So that's what I'm saying. What, what are we offering them instead, which is not imported, mm -hmm. which is something that they have immediate access to? Or if they're going to be eating those foods, are there any herbs that they could be using in their cooking that are going to offset the negative, the injurious aspects mm -hmm. of it? So it's about how do we get things. It must be that there is efficacy. It can be useful. There is in our local diet things that we can do to make sure that we remain in good health. Do you think that the, the, the historical and traditional diets that, that people would have engaged in through short time that was specific to their environment and their lifestyle. Absolutely, it was. And, and lifestyles have changed. A lot so of change. diets must change. Yeah. And that is part of the education. Their lifestyle has changed, therefore you can't eat so much of it. Okay, so it's about a different, it's moderation. It's about eating more pulses, having more beet not so? Mm -hmm. So part of what we do, all the Christmas traditions, the, the, the kinds of foods that we eat, and we need to look at what are the nutritional values and what we can say we can eat less of and more of, right? So it's not going to break your pocket because that's what you're saying. They can't follow that diet. They can't afford it. But maybe there is something that is affordable within that society that you can look at. So again, it comes back to research and, it, and then educating people about your findings. Because very often we tend to do research and research remains in the ivory tower of the academy. It is not made to be accessible to the people about whom the research was done. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, there is some loss in translation between the researcher and policy decision making as well. Oh, that is that loss. There's a gap. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a chasm. Yeah. You call it a gap. I call <laughs> it a chasm. And that is that is something that we need to look at, that gap between it. So it's like we need to bring more people to the table. We need to have, con the conversation has to be expanded to include more people with different, coming at it from different perspectives so, yeah. because each perspective, perspective mm -hmm. has value. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why we are actually discussing the, the whole aspect of zoonosis being a blind spot of One Health because you focus on zoonosis only. 
you're going to miss the wider picture. And, 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 and that's why we're hoping to encourage us all here, as part of this course, as part of this community, to really understand that that health has so many layers. I mean, an example that I will speak about from a, from a, from a, from a One Health perspective is that we speak about Chagas disease, Trypanosoma cruzii. It's the main cause of congestive heart failure in many countries in South America, Southern Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, for example. It's caused by a protozoan organism that's spread by a vector, the reduvid bug or the kissing bug. But the people that are most affected by Chagas disease are those that are from the descendants of the Amerindians, the, the, the Incas, the, the Aztecs, and they have traditional forms of, of dwellings. They live in earthen homes, for example. Mm -hmm. And the, the thinking is their modality of living through the earthen homes, for example, that's encouraging and supporting the, the vector's presence in the domestic environment, which of course is reducing the, the, the distance between themselves and the vectors and increasing the likelihood of exposure. So, so that's one perspective between looking at, at an infectious disease that has some significance with regards to the environment that seems to be traditional. What are your thoughts on that to open up the, the, the blind spot with okay. that, this context? Now that's interesting because, so you talk about the Aztecs, you talk about the Incas. Was there in those pre-Columbian societies a history of that disease? Not that I can really tell. Good, so that's something we saw because they have not changed their, their dwellings, eh? So then were these vectors always there? And if they were, how come they were not succumbing to it at that time? Was there not some, maybe there was something in that environment, pre-Columbian environment, that acted as a mitigating force against it that has changed? So sometimes we keep thinking, okay, it's what they're doing, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's what they're doing now, but it's also impacted and some new variable has been introduced into that environment so that what they were doing and, and being safe doing it, they are no longer safe now because these new variables have been introduced. Maybe it might be as something as simple as the plants and the trees around them that have been cut down mm -hmm. because of excessive logging and maybe mm -hmm. there were variants there. So the point is, we need to get the full story or else we'll always have a blind spot mm -hmm. because we're tending to look to have a kind of tunnel vision. We're thinking yeah. this is the answer, but sometimes the answer is in a different place altogether or there are many different kinds of answers, different approaches to it. Because I mean, that's the first thing I thought of, but if it's a disease now, it would have always been a disease because they haven't changed how they're living mm -hmm. according to what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. So if it wasn't there then, why is it here now? What have encouraged the What factors? has encouraged it? Yeah. Or what forces might have been in that environment to discourage the vectors that no longer discourage them? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's very interesting as well. But that does require the type of research that you speak about, going back into, into understanding the cultural practices, cultural practices as well, yeah. But, but, but it's tricky. It's let me, hard. Let me tell you why, why it's so hard. When you think about research and health, I mean, whether it's the funding, whether it's the mm -hmm. priority areas. Mm -hmm. If you want to align your work, let's say, with, with the type of opportunities to be published to, to, to go to conferences to receive funding. You won't get it for that. You won't get it for that. No, because it's not sexy. <laughs> it's not popular. But, but, but then, if we are to examine even the definition of health, physical, mental, and social well-being, is there something that's lacking there? Well, when you think about health, what is it that we all need to consider to bring the, these cultural practices into the mainstream, into the priorities, in the research, into the interventions yes. as relates to, to, to population health? Because when I think of health, I don't just think of physical health. That's, and I always think that there is a link between the physical and the spiritual. And that's where culture comes in because it's a way of being, it's a way of thinking about the world. And sometimes how you that, that is going to affect your reality. So, for example, people discover that they are ill, and they will say, "When I they play, begin to plan for the funeral rather than planning to live, they think death is inevitable, and they are going to therefore have a grand send off." How can you, as a doctor, accommodate that? Because you're thinking it's important for you to live, but they might be thinking, "No, there is." glory in death, okay? So, 
then what kind of conversation can you have? Right? Some people say, for example, they don't wish to die in pieces. They wish to go back to their maker in the very way that they came, with their two legs and their two hands and their two eyes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they will not have surgery that yeah. is going to remove that. So understanding that is going to help the kind of conversation you can have with this. Because this is not a physical thing anymore. It is, a, it is mental. It is a, about the psyche of the person and how you're going to cope with that. And that's something that we tend to, I don't think, is it because the tools for that kind of exploration are very difficult, it and it requires a kind of retraining, okay? And maybe that is part of what medical humanities, they sh that, that, that's the role it can play, because it can offer at least a different kind of way of seeing the world, bringing people to understand that it is not, we don't all share the same worldview. And because we don't all share the same mm -hmm. worldview, yeah. how we practice. So you see, again, we come back to that word, cultural competence. Mm -hmm. I don't. I keep thinking that we've used and abused that term. And maybe the time has come for us to redefine what we mean by cultural competence. Right. So that's that's part of what I mean. Society that is very spiritual. How do you deal with that? This health a spiritual issue for them. How do you cope with that? And in some communities that we work with, for example, I mean, in order to effect any change, you have to go through what is considered their, their, their local healer, for example, mm -hmm. to even access the community. Yes. And you have to pay, because they're a local healer, you have to also be respectful of the tradition, Their practices. honor him, yes. recognize him as an elder and an ancestor mm -hmm. before you can even have an opening yeah. to have a conversation. Okay, but very many times we come to those societies and we believe that our values, our education makes us superior. So we don't go in with respect. We go in to pontificate, to tell them what to do, mm -hmm. rather than to dialogue with them. And so for us to be effective in any way, it has to begin from a position of respect. To recognize that there are differences and to understand that we can work with those differences, because we have to. That's the only way we can be successful is to understand that, hey, we may not see, we may not begin by seeing the world in the same way. But that doesn't mean we may not end up. Mm -hmm. Not maybe necessarily in the same place, but at least close to each other. But to me, that, that, I mean, that, that it's is very hard, you know. And that requires like a life experience. Because ah. what happens is that, um, look, the, the education, let's say, where we receive the, the focus on, on sciences or or languages, or arts, or whatever else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, th that, in a sense, is quite structured. Yes. And it may also be confining to, to, to building the type of worldview that, that you speak about. Yes. So, so what you probably need more is, is, is some type of life experience or life history experience to engender that consciousness about the, 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 the various aspects of worldviews that exist. Yeah, I think that that is one, but I would want to say that uh, most people who do medicine have done an undergraduate degree, mm -hmm. and part of what an undergraduate degree gives you is a broad general education that will expose you to psychology, sociology, politics, economics, religion, literature, mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. that's, what you, and that's the value of a good undergraduate degree, that it is going to give you that broad base. And so therefore, when you specialize, you will always bring to those these inter and the interventions that you have gained from those other experiences. So we must never dismiss what happens at the undergraduate level, what happens in schools, and you have that kind of education. It just you tend not to valorize but, it. Yeah. You tend to put all the emphasis on what happens in med school, forgetting that all of these other things have happened. I mean, a doctor is required to take a patient history. Mm -hmm. When that doctor takes a patient history, what else is there than just pen and paper. Behind the pen and paper, there's a wealth of attitudes and prejudices and, and value beliefs systems. and value systems. And maybe these things, you need to check them in at the door. You need to always be aware that these are governing what you're saying and, and be self-reflexive and apply the necessary correctives so else you will not get a true history of that patient. So I'm saying it's there, but we always have to safeguard ourselves against it. Mm -hmm. And I guess now we're, we're sort of living in the world of social media. 
Absolutely. And that's bringing to the fore its own cultural practices mm -hmm. and its own space, its own environment. And that's also selecting for different life experiences as well. Yes. well what are your comments in terms of this new form of, of communication, this new form of interaction, this new form of, of living? Which seems quite unchecked, in fact. It seems, <laughs> it seems just like a free-for-all. And you know, a lot of times we say, I think these are all very wonderful tools because like a knife, it can wound, but it can be very useful. It can cut, it can help us to prepare. So we have to look at what social media is doing, how we can use those media to reach more people, mm -hmm. how we can insert ourselves into different conversations occurring there, how we can help to apply correctives because sometimes the conversation needs to shift or you can introduce a new opinion, okay? And I don't think we in the academy make enough use of social media. Mm -hmm. We tend to think, oh, this is just a newfangled thing that is going to go away, rather than recognizing it's here to stay, yeah. and therefore, because it's here to stay, how can we use it? How can we use Twitter and Instagram? How we can send messages out to people? How we can use mobile education? Okay, these are things that we can begin to think more about because that is part of the reality. And I think it's going to come. I think change is coming. I am not going to be naive enough to think that change happens overnight. Mm -hmm. Change happens because we are committed to change and because we are persistent in wanting to effect change. That's how it happens. Now, the World Health Organization have three priority areas that they're focusing on right now. Mm -hmm. One is the issue of climate change, the other is the issue of antimicrobial resistance, and it is refugee health. Now, in all of these, what is antimicrobial resistance? Okay, that has to do with our, our practices and traditions with regards to animal production, mm -hmm. the use of technology in that aspect of it. The refugee health issues, I mean, that has to do with the value associations, value systems, and and conflicts with different societies and different cultures. Outside is coming in. Exactly. As a source of contagion. And the environment is how culturally we have disassociated ourselves with the environment and that sort of devaluation of selected for certain practices which serve to degrade the environment. Exactly. At the same thing. So in all of these priority areas, as I begin to increase my, my field of vision mm -hmm. from, from the blind spot itself, I am beginning to see and recognize the, the, the necessity for cultural understandings and interventions. Right. And he said, so if we were to, let's say, identify each of these, what are some of the reflections and considerations that we need to bear cognizant of from a social cultural context? Okay, let's look at the refugee. Yeah. Okay, let's look at, let's begin with attitudes to refugees. I mean, their health would be important. We have them in closed quarters. Mm -hmm. We do not provide for any social amenities for them. Why do we treat them that way? They have always been refugees. Why do we treat them that way? Because we view them as a source of contagion. Mm -hmm. Okay, And I do not only mean health contagion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are going to come in and they're going to take from us. They're going to put us at risk. Mm -hmm. They're going to put our jobs at risk. They're going to be more of them. We're going to have to share housing with them. And so just that attitude mm -hmm. of exclusion is going to force them into their own little world and as a world that do not have access to those other things. So the very problem that we're trying to solve will get exacerbated because they live in unhealthy conditions. And no matter what you do, there will always be, and I'm going to use the word carefully, the bleeding of those refugees into the fabric of your society. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot keep them, you cannot keep the outsiders out all the time. They are going to be there in your shops. So the, point, the, the important thing to do is to recognize that if they are there, and if, they are, if you have allowed them to come in, then you, to create, then you need to create structures that are hospitable to them. Because it is in the creation of those structures that you are going to be impacting on your own well-being. Because failure to do so is going to put you at risk. Because you cannot, if you have let them in, 
we've already let in, and they're putting in scare quotes, the source of that contagion. So we have to attend to them in a humane way. We need to recognize that, that there are certain social facilities that we need to give them access to. There is an economic need that they are going to have. So if we do these things, it's going to make for a safer world for all of us. Because they're not going to stop one place. They're going to travel. And as they travel, I suppose you're going to think that they're traveling with all of those baggage and disease being one of that baggage. And you know, when I think of disease, I always take it and break it up into dis-ease, mm -hmm. when you are no longer at ease in that society. And so that's, that's part of it. And now climate change is something that we are so terribly concerned about, as we should be. Mm -hmm. Global warming is a problem for everybody. The melting of the polar ice caps is going to raise the ocean levels. It's going to put low-lying communities at risk. In the Caribbean, we might say, but we did nothing to create this. But we are going to bear the brunt yeah. of it, absolutely. The oceans are getting warmer. What's going to be the consequence of this to our marine life? Okay, especially people who have a fish diet. What's going to be the consequence of the oceans getting higher to places that are below sea level, like Guyana? Okay, so it does concern us. What can we do in our practices? I think that everybody, and that's what part of what sustainable development is, how we are going to, in our small way, reduce our ecological footprints, because there are a lot of habits that we have that we, we need to discontinue. So we must never think that climate change has to do with outside the Americas, mm -hmm. the big countries, the developed world. No, we too can play our part, so at least to make our part safe. So even our con consumption of plastic. Mm -hmm. What have we waste done matter. and waste man? And we talk about it all the time. But something as simple as taking the extra plastic bags to the supermarket so that you don't have to get new bags. But if the supermarkets would incentivize this on a more sustained level throughout the islands, then that would help to reduce the number of the amount of plastic that we're using. But we again, we're going to talk about recycling and plastic and waste management, we have to start in the schools. Because I'm sure that you will notice that plastic bottles are something that is in great supply in those spaces. So you see why I always keep coming back, if we need to, if we want change, we have to be the change that we want to be. We have to be agents of change. We have to be able to go out there and evangelize so that change can come. And I use evangelize mm -hmm. it's very specifically mm -hmm. because it is like kind of trying to spread a new gospel, mm -hmm. a gospel of change. It's, 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 it's sort of really contextualized the fact that, that oh, the challenge we're facing with, it requires a whole type of societal involvement yes. and, and engagement at, at the same time. And that is, that is, that's exactly why I'm sitting here with you today. Mm -hmm. I think we have to involve the society. We have to, at a university level, we must involve all the disciplines mm -hmm. because that will make the conversation richer yeah. and that will allow for more fruitful partnerships mm -hmm. so that whatever the work that you're doing can be more productive yeah, yeah. because you have more players yeah. supporting you in yeah. it. Agreed, agreed. On. And with that point of in involvement and engagement as well, do we have anyone online who would like to, to maybe Add to the conversation, ask any questions, have any have any queries or concerns as well. Dr. Bedeza, we have a question that came in from Alfred when we were talking about cultural drivers. Um, and uh, the question was, with respect to HIV and AIDS, what do you think are the cultural drivers of this epidemic? It's on your screen. Um, well, so, so probably let's, let's just review the whole HIV AIDS spectrum of experiences that, that, we, that we had in this planet so far. Um, from, from my understanding, this became an issue, let's say, around the very early 1980s, early to mid-1980s or so. And at that time, there was varying levels of stereotyping, varying levels of, of attitudes, perceptions that, that the global community had at large. The initial conversation began with HIV AIDS being an issue of, of, of homosexual populations mm -hmm. and groups. Mm -hmm. um, we also had 
discussions on particular ethnic groups being the ones who were the source of HIV AIDS um, and also where the focus of HIV AIDS was. We've also had evolving thoughts over time with regards to whether it came from an animal or not or, or, or whether it was a, a human specific disease. And since that time, the world has spent a lot of effort and attention on treatment or management of, of the disease and not necessarily attending to the social cultural aspects that I am now beginning to appreciate, especially from the conversation with Professor McDonald as well. And, and, and the social cultural aspects have, have sort of been sidelined because the stereotypes still exist. Mm -hmm. The biases in terms of which population groups are affected and which, which regions of the world are more susceptible. That remains. So Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the highest prevalence, mm -hmm. followed by the Caribbean, Caribbean, right? And then Southeast Asia, for example. Countries where you have different ethnic groups, um, the Afro-Caribbean or the African, and then the, the lower economic regions of Southeast Asia, for example. These are the regions that are most affected by HIV AIDS. And these are the regions as well that have been challenged by the stereotypical biases. My perspective is that the focus on the treatment have led a lot of successes because now persons with HIV and AIDS can have a projected life expectancy as well as a quality of life. So there's value in that. But at the same time, the prevalence has not changed. So we're treating people more effectively, but we're not necessarily working towards preventing people from actually developing the condition. And I think that that has to do with the, the, the stereotypes, because the stereotypes have led and fed different types of, of, of determinants in terms of behaviors. Because if I am a, a social cultural group mm -hmm. and I'm being labeled upon and I am being defined based on a certain type of, let's say, conduct or practice, well, then I tend to associate with it and I will act accordingly yeah. as well. So I, I think that the social cultural aspect of this disease have, have maintained the, the burden where the burden is with Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean, Southeast Asia. So that's where I see the social cultural considerations serving as the initial conversation, the evolving trend of thought, but also serving to, to create like a, like a, like a paralysis as to where HIV AIDS is in terms of its distribution. That's true. But you notice when you're speaking, you talk about treatment. Yes. But we know that treatment is not affordable. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, so and accessible. Yeah. And accessible. So already, that's an uneven playing field. The Caribbean is the second highest in the world. Are we asking why? Okay. Are we asking about education? Are we asking about the practices like as an event like Carnival, for example? where you have a lot of um, unchecked sexual practices. So you have a lot of unsafe sex. And then you have the people saying, OK, you can't give them condoms because you're encouraging them to have sex. This at the school it, level, at for the example. School level. Yeah. But if that's, again, what I'm saying, if you bring more people to the table when you're having those conversations, then you're going to have more support. Because it's always you're fighting a different group. You're going to be fighting the churches who are going to be saying you're encouraging promiscuity. But other people are going to say, look, if there's going to be sexual activity, then it should be safe sexual activity. So we're not encouraging, we are helping to protect. What about people who are sex workers in the region? Mm. And we know that there is a lot of sex work. Mm. Okay, so are we going out as a public health issue to do that kind of educating, to do that kind of screening? What are we doing? So a lot of times we turn a blind eye to it because I keep thinking sometimes we don't seem to be interested in prevention, mm -hmm. right? It's not about getting rid of it. It's about how to can manage it with, med with medication. Or isolate it. Oh, isolate with it. With anxiety. But you can't, I keep telling you, these yeah, things can yeah. never be isolated. Yeah. They will bleed through, yeah. right? But these practices are existing and there is a sociocultural implication to it. The solution, therefore, if there if it has that aspect to it, the solution it has, has to be broad the, based. Yeah. yeah okay? Yeah. Sure. sure. Um, I see a hand raised from Tremaine, and Tremaine also wrote into the um, 
into the chat area. Tremaine, did you want to contribute to the HIV AIDS discussion or, or something else? I'm going to unmute you here. Yeah. Hi, Tremaine. Join us on the, on the conversation. Um, Tremaine, I've unmuted you and there you hi, go. Hi, good on. afternoon. How are you guys doing? Good. Hi, Tremaine. I welcome. Nice. I just wanted to mention, I think that BBC does a good job in educating us about earlier practices that happened when we evolved, if we do be evolution from, let's say, less primitive to, you know, using tools and so on. I think that well, when I was at my bachelor's level, I think that that was necessary to understand, okay, well, we were less primitive, we had to use our hands, you know, we had to use fire. I think that I didn't really grasp that until I finished my bachelor's. I think that BBC there was a show recently called The History of Africa where Zain Abidabi, she started with where it was believed that we kind of had been changed from, you know, Homo sapien to more advanced and so on. Also shows like Natural Geographic, Morgan Freeman did, I think, two series on the story of us and the story of God. I think those are real foundational, you know, documentaries to start, you know, start us thinking that, hey, we came from less primitive let's think more critical and let's go from, you know, using basic education techniques, going from what we did not know, sorry, what we know to what we don't know, I think that's a real good starting point. That's excellent, Jermaine. And even while you were speaking, I was thinking so many times we, we don't know enough about where we came from. And as a people, even when I'm listening, I'm listening to you say Africa, we tend to think of Africa as a country rather than as a continent with so many different cultural Culture, practices. Yeah. So what we do in that kind of thinking is that we erase differences because we flatten it out. But we, the good thing is that increasingly there are more and more educational programs that are going to show us, tell us more about where we came from. And yes, I agree that some of the things we are, we are doing, we need to discontinue as practices because they were unsafe practices. And I think that all societies are going to, all societies want to continue themselves and therefore they are going to be interested in seeking safety. But you have to first show them that this was unsafe for the following reasons. And I think that a lot of things they discovered, by the way, incidentally were unsafe, you know. Mm. Yeah, yes, because that's how societies evolved. They would discover, okay, so you can't eat this. This is not going to be good for you for a particular reason. So, uh, for example, I'm thinking of something like bitter cassava. Mm. What we call bitter cassava, that we make farine and cassava. It is a poison. There is a poison in it that has to be extracted. Mm -hmm. And I keep thinking, every time I teach students about it, I'm thinking that long ago when it was being extracted, there must have been many dead people before yeah. it was successfully extracted. Mm -hmm. And that's part of how societies evolve, through experimentation, through people finding that out. So yeah, as these shows, these programs make more education available to the people, it's going to allow for a modification of behavior. So, so I guess the, the main theme is to utilize the opportunity of, of, of social and cultural constructs to inform practices that, that, that are more healthy as well. Because as well, it's, it, the, the, if the cause is social cultural, well then you, your, your solution must also be social cultural. Well, that's it. You have to change it at yeah. that level. And yeah. it doesn't mean that because you change it now, it's going to it's on, always ongoing mm -hmm. because society is evolving different, there are going to be different forces that work at all points, and therefore we, it's a conversation that has to be ongoing, right? So that, that, and if once we begin with that mindset, that we recognize that it is through dialogue that we can effect change, then we are already on the road to wellness, right? I have a question, maybe some my clarification. Mm -hmm. we, we, we use, at least I am using this term social cultural. Um, and it sort of is an amalgamation between society and culture. So sad. Um, two terms to, that sometimes people will use interchangeably, but mm -hmm. there's also mutual exclusive, exclusivity yeah. between them. Can you sort of demarcate to us what is similar and different as relates to social and cultural aspects? Okay. Because you have the, oh, well, let us put it this way. All social is not cultural. Right. 
answer, but all culture is all cultural social. Mm -hmm. I would want to say, you see, it's yeah. this is going to open a hole because I'm <laughs> sure that um, we could talk about this for hours. Yeah. You know, what is social? It is really the society, the beliefs of a society, yeah. because culture is what we do. Culture practices. is in our, our practices, okay. in our everyday practices. So the everyday practices in a society mm -hmm. is when we talk about sociocultural, that's what we're talking about. Okay? The definition might tend to vary for different people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that as a broad definition, we could just talk about our the habits, our ways of being, the things that we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's what our culture would be. You know, how we what we eat, what we how we think about the world, how we react to our the people that we meet, how we engage with people. Music, how language. we music, the language, the religion, the sports we play. Okay. okay. So like almost every aspect of life. Because that, but that's yeah. what culture is. Culture yeah. is what we do. Yeah. Okay. So it, the, what we do also affects how we, how well we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we do will affect our physical health mm -hmm. very, very dramatically because there are a lot of unsafe mm -hmm. things that we're doing that we need to rethink mm -hmm. and, and understand that these are unsafe because all of us want to be safe. You know, mm -hmm. we want to be of well. Of course. And so, therefore, it's for you to find a way into that conversation. And so, that is always for me, how do you get a way in? What is the way into talking about them? So that, as for public health, how do you promote public health? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you use the media, as you said, social media, the available media, billboards, signposts, oral culture, storytelling? Yeah. Okay, because you're going to be having different groups, and it's going to be that you meet different groups in different places. I mean, we've been talking a lot about um, art and how art and journaling can help people um, as a return to wellness, psychological wellness, mm -hmm. as a way of healing, therapy, yeah. as a kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. So these things are—they are not. These are not new conversations, you know. It's just that we're now talking about it in a different context. Because we're talking about it in terms of the blind spots, mm -hmm. but and therefore it gives us a wonderful opportunity for two seemingly disparate groups to come into conversation: the literature professor and the uh, infectious disease mm -hmm. provider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's, it's it's it's. So it has brought us to the table. I've seen a necessity for it, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and so hopefully this is the start of a conversation, so that going forward. You will at least remember. Mm -hmm. It will be, and I, when I am teaching, will think, "Hey, this provides us with a wonderful opportunity to bring you in, so you could talk about the science of it, mm -hmm. and we can engage because it doesn't have to be that we are going to be talking and uh, speaking only to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We need to speak to each other. Mm -hmm. To our medical colleagues out there, those who are taking a history from a patient, for example." Mm -hmm. If I were to ask, you know, history, everyone is so pressed for time and everything in terms of, oh, I mean, to, to sort of work on a patient. Right. But having said that, though, uh, with the inextricable link between society and culture and its impact on health. Right. What type of questions, what type of parameters, what type of considerations does a physician need to bear in mind when collecting the history of an individual patient? First thing, we're going to have to recognize that people come to stories differently. Mm -hmm. And very often, sometimes people have a very long preamble. And I'm thinking, the doctor is listening, I'm thinking, but where is this going? Mm -hmm. But that is, a, some people, that is a way of beginning a narrative to give you the backstory. And the backstory looks like a very, very long story. And if you do not have the time, mm -hmm. And you hurry them along, then there are things that you're going to miss yes. because you didn't get that whole story. That's one. Secondly, you need to understand also that people, there is not everything, there is a Caribbean phrase, not everything good to talk. <laughs> there, are, there is a, a divide, a distance between the doctor as the official mm -hmm. and the patient. And sometimes the patient will not reveal certain things to the doctor mm -hmm. because that is not fit for the doctor's yeah. ears. Yeah. Okay, so there's that, that guy. And so for the doctor needs sometimes to 
listen to what is not being said mm -hmm. along with what is being said. And th that's again where the cultural sensitivity comes in. Yeah. Because you have to be able to li listen to and read silence. Mm -hmm. Because silence is not always mm -hmm. nothing being said. Silence is something that is being said that you're not understanding. Okay? So that, that's yeah. part of what I'm saying. Sometimes you have to let them, let them tell, let them speak uninterrupted. It, that helps sometimes, yeah. I think. Yeah. Interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure how, how much patience we could get you. Oh, no, I know. I meant to see you remember. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get a lot of them. I know. But those you get, you will have done yeah. thorough, with. thorough, yeah. And so I think it is not about quantity. But if you do it once, that you sets you up at his... for, for your overall management of the patient over your course of your career and the patient's life. Yes, because you, you can so just do it once and one do it well. well. Yeah. Yes. So it requires that type of investment mm -hmm. in time and effort at the very beginning as well. I think so. Sometimes it just feels like um, this factory line. Um, yeah. Medicine, you come in, you go, you get stamped, and you just move along on the conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. But very often, I think it is important that people tell the stories because even the act of telling the story is an act of catharsis. Mm -hmm. You're getting it out of you, mm -hmm. and that is itself a good thing. Yeah, you know, sure. but it's for them to listen. Good, exactly. Okay. And any other comments or, or questions coming coming from the from the from the group guys? Uh, we don't have anything in queue right now. Yeah, it's it's, it's I, I actually um, it's an eye opener for me personally, and I hope it's the same for, for for all of us, because when we think about about health, I mean, we all have our our locate localities mm -hmm. and where we position ourselves in, but it's if you only look at what is, you know, you have to see what could be. And that's why it's important to look from the lens of other people and other perspectives as well, so then you can really appreciate the bigger picture as well at the same time. And that is the, the initiative and the intention of having a seminar like this, looking at the blind spot, but looking beyond the blind spot, and certainly engage in the conversation of, of social and cultural aspects of health as well. And I, I, I think it, it, it hopefully it augurs for for a continuation in effort, not just from a conversation perspective, but from even, yeah, whether it's a research, whether it's education, mm -hmm. whether it's a treatment exactly. side of it. Because exactly. we can't we can't necessarily engage social and cultural aspects just through a conversation only. No. Because then it will not be able to attain its no, full but potential. It just becomes self-indulgent. Yeah. We just talk to each yeah. other. But yeah. It has to be more than that. And that's why I really appreciate this opportunity because at least it brings us to the same table yeah, yeah. where we can talk to each other and it can we can begin to partner with each other. Sure, so I really sure. appreciate it. Yeah, well, we appreciate the opportunity as well to, to share, to learn from each other as well at the same time. And I know that um, th this session is part of an ongoing series that we've had. And we've had a variety of topics. We've, we have covered infectious diseases. Yes. We yeah. have, but we have also covered mental health issues, environmental health issues and certainly continue to engage in the social and the cultural aspects of health as well. Mm -hmm. so thank you for sharing in today's session with us. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope that the listeners also enjoyed it. Yeah. And thank you guys very much. If there, if there are any other questions or if anyone have any other questions or comments, please feel free to let us know. Otherwise, it's, well, it's goodbye for now from St. George's University or Trubu Campus in Grenada here. And stay tuned for our final seminar in the month of December as we complete the seminar series, but also complete the year, which is 2017. This year has sort of, how has the year gone by for you? Was it fast? Was it slow? Oh, it went by and went so, it went by so quickly. Yeah. I am still dizzy with that speed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but I trust that, that you guys um, continue to enjoy your various pursuits. And we'll see you guys in December for another installment of our course, One World, One Health, One Medicine. Well, on behalf of Professor McDonald, and myself, Satish Pedesi, as well as John Soap, our support online. Thank you very much and goodbye for now. Thank you, guys. Got a few thank yous coming in from the students. See you next month. Yep, thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Thanks. Bye bye.